Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Hello and welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your home for all things related to helping you on your journey to finding that amazing job. Each episode, I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, entrepreneurs, coaches, graduate recruiters, and bloggers who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute-ish show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had a decade ago when I graduated. And hello and welcome to the 79th episode of the Graduate Job Podcast. It's a week before Christmas and I've got a little crack of you today. Have you ever thought about a few different jobs and wondered what it would be like to try them out? Well, my guest today did just that, and then some. I'm joined by Emma Rosen, author of the new book, The Radical Sabbatical, where she describes how she quit her dream job with the civil service fast stream to embark on an adventure to try 25 different jobs by the age 25. It's an inspiring episode on many levels. In it, Emma shares the emotions of getting the job of her dreams on the civil service fast stream and then the inner turmoil she went through as she quit not long after, when she realised it just wasn't the job for her. She explores the background to embarking on 25 different jobs by the age of 25 and how she went about getting those all-important work placements. She shares brilliant insights into the mindset, skills and approach needed to get work experience with any company and why you shouldn't be put off thinking that it's a competitive industry that you're applying to. She also reveals her insider secrets of exactly what you need to do when you approach a company so that you can get that vital yes to work experience. No matter where you are in your job search, and if you haven't even thought about getting work experience or trying a work placement, this is still an episode you aren't going to want to miss. Now don't worry about trying to remember anything you hear today as a full transcript of today's show and all of the links we discuss can be found over in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash 25. You'll also find there links to all of the other 78 episodes of the show which cover every aspect, and I mean every aspect, of getting a graduate job. From help with interviews, assessment centres, to applying to specific companies, to finding a job you love, to dealing with stress as you look for a graduate job. If it's a graduate job related question, then I've got an episode on it. And if I haven't got an episode on the subject, let me know and I'll record one for you. Before we start, let's have a little message from today's sponsor, who are our friends over at careergym.com. Now, if I said to you, are you ready to do the verbal numerical reasoning tests for the job of your dreams right now? I bet most of you would say no. Well, graduate employers don't hang about. Some of them are going to give you as little as two to three days notice once you've applied before you've got to do the tests. So you need to make sure you are ready and willing to do the tests and start practicing now. Which is where careergym.com comes in. Careergym is the number one place for you to undertake all of your psychometric tests which you're going to face when you apply for a graduate job. The bottom line is that no matter what graduate job you apply for, from the global giants to the small company around the corner, you're going to have to do some sort of verbal and numerical reasoning, situational judgment and working style tests. The best advice for passing these tests is to practice, practice, practice. Well, you can practice these all at careergym.com. They're all produced by testing experts and exactly the same as the ones you'll see in the real graduate job tests. You can practice them as you want, or you can do them in exam mode under time pressure, and they all come with detailed explanations and solutions, and you can track your progress and see how you compare against your peers. Now, if you're applying for a graduate job, you're going to have to do them, so don't put it off. Pull your finger out now and start revising straight away to make sure you don't fall at this very first hurdle. I've been recommending the site for years to the clients I coach and it comes very highly recommended. And what's even better is if you use the code GJP, you'll get 20% off all of their tests. It's a small price to pay to make sure you don't fall at this first hurdle. So head on over to careergym.com, that's careergym.com, and use the code GJP to get 20% off and start practicing today. Now on with the show. I'm very pleased to welcome Emma Rosen to the show, author of the upcoming book, The Radical Sabbatical, The Millennial Handbook to the Quarter Life Crisis. Emma, welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. And you've had such a 
interesting and uh, jam-packed career so far uh, and we're going to explore that in more detail on this show today but maybe before we start do you want to uh, just introduce yourself to the listeners and uh, how it is you came to be writing uh, the book The Radical Sabbatical? Um, yeah sure so I um, left university and went on to the civil service fast stream which is a government's graduate scheme um, and quite quickly realised that it wasn't for me, but was left wondering what on earth is. Um, and after having a little bit of an existential crisis at 24, um, I decided to go and try 25 different jobs in a year before my 25th birthday, which obviously works out was about roughly one every two weeks. Um, and they were really, really diverse. Um, so some were kind of really traditional professional careers and others were completely the other end of the spectrum um, and so I spent a year doing that and I completed a project at the end uh, about a year ago now um, and I've written a book about it and about what um, both what I've learned from it but also how um, you can apply a similar methodology to our own life if you don't know what it is that you want to do whether that's as a student still or whether that's as a graduate already in a graduate job and you're not feeling the love, but you have no idea what it, what you should be doing instead. This is a book about how to figure that out and kind of really takes you through in detail the steps of going through that process. Hey, excellent. And wow, that's, uh, as I said, you've that's a jam-packed, uh, jam-packed career already. So let's just break that down into different bits. So you said you got um, a job on the very highly coveted and uh, much applied to civil service fast stream. So you know that's many people's listening's dream to uh, to get on that so i mean how how was it that you you spent all that energy you got a place in it and then what what just didn't feel right when you got there um yeah so i mean it was my dream job too and it took me i think two or three goes to get on the scheme um so i i totally remember feeling feeling like it was something that was so unachievable and and glamorized for me um but i think that that was exactly it that it was glamorized um and i think this is possibly true of grad schemes in general I think there's a lot of budget that goes into the marketing um, but I think you need to make sure that you know what you're really getting yourself into um, and kind of understanding what goes on in a job on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of learning what the highs and the lows and the ups and the downs are before you actually go and do it um, and I think that's why I've spent so much time now focusing on work experience um, is the whole idea of you try before you buy, you actually go away and understand what it is that that job entails before you commit to, say, four years of doing it. <clears throat> so I think for me, the far stream, um, I, I think I'm just not the sort of person that works well on a grad scheme. I'm not good at um, having kind of a really um, prescribed career path. So kind of you're given a placement and that's what you go and do. And you do that kind of several different ones over the space of four years. And that's that. And I guess what I realized was that I want to be the one that's in control of my own career, um, which means that a grad scheme probably isn't the right path for me. But obviously it took me going away and doing that to realize that that was the answer. Um, so, so yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't right for me. I think the civil service more widely probably was, but the way that the grad scheme worked at the time, and I think this must be different now, because um, this was three-ish years ago, um, was that you're either on the fast stream or you're not in the civil service. And so for me, that meant, well, I'm, I'm going to try something else instead then. Um, but um, one point that I think is really important to make is there's different, you want different things at different stages of your life. And that wasn't right for me at that stage of my life. But in 10 years time, it absolutely might be when my priorities are different. Um, and so I don't think it's a reflection so much of a negative experience with the civil service or the fast stream. I think it's just, it wasn't right for me at that time of my life. And it was just about being, I guess, um, either bold or naive enough to um, actually run with that decision and actually embrace that. Yeah, no, and it's um, bold's a really good word because you know I speak to many people I coach and they're in jobs that they're not happy with, and often the, you know, as you said, the the marketing is maybe portrays um, a different side of the the work than you actually be doing, and mm. um, you know I do sometimes find that people don't really 
put the work in to speak to people who are actually doing the job to find out what it's really like and there's a big difference between speaking to people and finding out what they actually do as opposed to yeah. the, the shiny brochure uh, which looks uh, very exciting and can be can be different to uh, what the real life is actually like and uh, just as a plug it's one of the things I'm going to explore in the upcoming episode on the pros and cons of going for a graduate scheme so uh, stay tuned for that one. So Emma, how uh, how long were you into the into the civil service fast room before you know that feeling in your stomach really started to kick in that this wasn't the right place for you? Oh, I think it was about two weeks. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, it was very I very quickly realised that this this was probably not such a good idea. But because of the I guess the prestige and the status of getting onto it, um, I felt a huge sense of guilt um, that I wasn't enjoying it. I felt very, very um, ungrateful and undeserving of the opportunity that I'd been given. And I was very, mu very much aware of how hard it was to get onto and how, mu how hard it had been for me to get onto it. And I kind of felt really confused about why I was so unhappy, but yet in such a good job that on the surface, on paper, ticked every single box I could have ever wanted in the job. Um, and it took the best part of a year to kind of work through those, those emotions and those feelings. Um, so to kind of figure out what was actually going on and why wasn't I enjoying it and this isn't the be all and end all and yeah it took it took a long time to work to work through that kind of going from I hate this but I just need to suck it up this is just work this is work's not meant to be a pleasant thing to do why am I expecting it to be a good thing which obviously now I know is not the case at all but at the time I, I kind of just felt I've got such an opportunity here how could I possibly throw it away just because I don't like it it sounded very it made me feel like I was very fickle um but again I think not liking your job it doesn't matter how old you are if you if you really hate your job you really hate your job and those feelings that come with that it doesn't matter if you're kind of in your 50s and having a midlife crisis say or if you're in your 20s and having a quarter life crisis you get the same uh, range of emotions and I think when um, you're in a job and you hate it so much that it's affecting your mental health you should not carry on doing that and I get contacted quite regularly by um, young people that are in jobs that they hate and they're, they're in counselling because of it and I think you should not be it should not get that bad it, it should never get that bad that it's it's genuinely impacting the rest of your life um which mine was um and it kind of got to a point where um it got to kind of yeah breaking point and I realized it was affecting my relationships with my friends and my family it was affecting my mental health and I was like you know what this 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 is going too far this is not how this is meant to be um and I guess I just decided to do something about it really um I kind of have a bit of a theory in that the extent that you hate your job uh the, the more you hate your job the less planning you're going to do about when about how you're going to leave it um if you kind of don't mind it too much you'll do loads of planning and figure out a really good course of action and if you're kind of towards the desperation rather than the inspiration end then I think you'll you'll just leave and you'll figure the rest out at some point um so that there was definitely an element of that for me um, but obviously I ended up coming up with an idea that kind of carried on and changed my path um, quite significantly, I guess. Yeah. And, and in terms of that, um, that breaking point, was there a aha moment where you thought, that's it, I'm, I'm done? And did you walk out the door or did you just not go in the next day? Or I mean, was it a, you know, a, um, a fit of peak that you just walked out? Or? Um, not directly. I mean, I think the kind of realization came I was I was on a, a holiday with some friends uh, in Spain for a week the first holiday I'd taken in about a year and I spent the whole time thinking about work and dreading work and dreading going back to work and even though I was on holiday the whole idea of work was still controlling my life and really like having in tears nearly every day of this holiday and I kind of realized that you know what well, this this is not how this is this is too much this is this is not how this is meant to be um and from that point I then started thinking about what I would do instead um, and then it just literally came down to one night of kind of sitting on the couch being like, what on earth am I going to do? And I kind of ended up coming up with this list. Um, and I just, off the top of my head, wrote down all the different ideas I had for careers over the years that I wanted to try and things that I kind of didn't necessarily um, seriously, or hadn't necessarily been seriously considering. But there were things that had always been in the back of my head um, that I'd always wondered about, I'd always been curious about, but perhaps had never had the opportunity to really explore them or they weren't seen as real jobs. Um, being a writer, for example, or like if you're when you're growing up, it's like, oh, that's not a real job. Um, I guess I wanted to I, I, I put all those down on a list and 
decided to go and do them pretty much and to kind of test all those all those assumptions to see if they were really true uh, and this was just before my 24th birthday and the idea of 25 jobs before turning 25 had quite a nice ring to it and it kind of gave me um a goal an end date um which i found really helpful and it kind of that it, it sounds silly but it was kind of an excuse to go and do it almost because it had a, t a set time frame yep um and and then yeah so i then all happened quite quickly i spent a couple of weeks building a website and trying to get the first few placements and i was quite lucky in that i got the first four placements in about a week i got them organized and um, that served as kind of a proof of concept or as a validation that this might actually work um and then yeah i had it in my notice um i had a month's notice to work out and i took two weeks the last two weeks of my annual leave holiday to go do a first placement uh which was archaeology in transylvania so wow. yeah quite different <laughs> to uh commuting in the northern line to uh to the center of london to go work for the civil service well exactly exactly and that was before i'd even officially left so it it really was set me up on the right path to be like this this is the right thing for me to do right now yeah and were the civil service supportive or did it did it just sort of blow the mind that you'd um do you want to leave uh yeah um i think some uh, plenty of my colleagues were really really supportive i think the grad scheme themselves were so um i initially explored whether i could take a sabbatical officially um to kind of it, take a year off and then kind of leave the door open a little bit but obviously that didn't happen um but yeah no i i think most of my colleagues who kind of weren't uh, on the grad scheme were really really supportive to be honest and some of them still read my blog today which is really nice um i think there's a lot of similar feelings in some of the people that i spoke to so when i kind of said that i was leaving i got quite a few emails from colleagues saying i feel like that too uh, yeah. and a total, a total age range not just kind of young people people all the way up to kind of near nearing retirement um yeah, it was it was really noticeable actually, and it made me realise. It was the first thing that made me realise I'm clearly not the only person that feels this way. There's there's wider issues going on here um, across the workforce, and not just with millennials, but obviously that's the the demographic that I've chosen to focus on. But I think it is a wider problem, definitely. So um, I can remember when I left my graduate scheme, and you know, you send the email around saying you're leaving, and letting people know you're leaving, and um, mm. you get loads of responses from people like, oh yeah. I'm looking for another job as well, or I'm, you know, I'd really want to leave as well. And you just really, well, you know, the prison door is open. All you need to do is just walk through it. There's nothing, you know, chaining you to uh, to your current job or current career. Mm. So, but there was a lot of jealous people on the grad scheme as well who uh, envied you, you know, taking having the having the guts to take that big step and uh, make the leap. Uh, I, I've never, I've never asked them that to be honest. They've not, they've not volunteered the information. But I mean. I think it's difficult. I think it is definitely the right thing for some people. Um, and I have friends that are still on it that I still see socially regularly. And they're doing really, really cool sounding jobs working. A lot of people are working on Brexit um, in healthcare and education. And I think it really is the right move for lots of people. But it's just being about being self-aware enough to know if it's the right thing for you or not. And if it's not, that's OK. You know, that's fine. But it's just, I think, very difficult when you're a young person going through university, for example, and you can see what all your peers are doing. They're all going towards these flashy, well-paid grad schemes and, and you, you feel like you want to keep up and you want to be on par with them. And, and so I think it's very easy to kind of go along with things. And then you kind of wake up one day and realize that actually maybe maybe that wasn't the right decision for you after all. Yeah. So how did you find the first placement then of uh, archaeology in Transylvania? Uh, so I called up my old university's archaeology department. Uh, I'd done about two modules in my first year in archaeology. So it was something I was interested in, but didn't actually have any experience of. Um, and I just called up the professor and, and said, do you, I explained the project and asked if they needed a helping hand on any excavations over the next year. And he turned around and said, actually, we really need somebody to go to Transylvania in two weeks time. Um, we'll pay. Don't worry can you go oh. <laughs> like yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> quickly googles where transylvania is <laughs> realizing it's romania and not having known that before at all um yeah yeah so i just immediately that this this seems to happen to me quite a lot and it's just the sort of thing that you just say yes to and ask questions later yep. and just don't quite don't question it just go with the flow 
Um, and I did. And then two weeks later, I landed in an airport called Cluj Napoca in northern uh, Romania and drove up into the Carpathian Mountains in Transylvania and spent two weeks in a village, doesn't even cover it, like a hamlet in the middle of the mountains working on excavating a Roman palace with a joint um, British and Romanian um, archaeology team. And yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> it was really, really great. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it was a lot of hard work. The first kind of few days were hard work, just of literal digging, trying to get deep enough to be at the right um, level underground of where all kind of the Roman level of artifacts were. And once we're down there, it's kind of literally very stereotypically kind of on your knees with a brush and a little trowel and going through absolutely everything and finding coins and hairpins and floor tiles of hypercourses and all sorts of things. And it was it was really fascinating, to be honest. It was a very different um, relationship with history. So I, I studied history at university um, and going to a museum and seeing artifacts is, is very different to realizing that you're the first person to hold something for 2000 years um you're the first person to see it and since it got dropped under the floor or whatever happened um and that's it was yeah it was incredible it was really really inspiring and yeah very romantic <laughs> i oh, think but um yeah yeah no i loved it uh, where did you move to for the second placement then um i then did wedding photography and i had an acquaintance who ran a small business in Ibiza doing wedding photography and called her up and asked if I could go along. And she said, yes, sure. You can sleep on my on, on my uh, living room floor. Um, and I got I got the flights and they were cheaper than my uh, weekly commute would be, would cost from home to go into London to the office. So it was actually cheaper for me to fly out to Ibiza and do that for a week than it was for me to stay in London, wow. um, which is insane. Um so yeah, and then went to a wedding there and worked as her second photographer um, and learned all about Photoshop and Lightroom editing um, and how to take photos in the right moments and lenses. And again, photography was something that I had like a very amateur interest in. And I have like a, an SLR camera, a very old beaten up one um, that I took with me and yeah, just kind of learning how she does her job and what she does. and. So her, her lifestyle is, or the time, was effectively um, spending her spring and summer in Ibiza photographing weddings, does like 40 a season, and, you know, photographers are quite, wedding photographers are quite well paid, um, and then spends the summer, uh, the winter, sorry, um, traveling around the world being a travel photographer, and it kind of funds the other side of her lifestyle, and that was incredible. And it was just something I'd never heard of before, I'd never come across before, uh, and that was one of the f very first lessons, I think, of trying to be different things out was being exposed to so many other people's lives and so many other people that just do things a bit differently. And it, it just goes to show you that um, not everybody has kind of the nine to five office career. There are a huge number of alternatives. It's just that we aren't exposed to them as much. We, we don't see them. Um, so we don't really know they're there until we go and explore and go and find out. Um, but that that was yeah that was her career and to be honest it sounds like a really good way to spend to spend this, at least the first few years of your career so it was, oh. yeah it was awesome oh, amazing that does uh, and as you said there's so many different careers and lifestyles out there that mm. people might not immediately think about or think that they're able to do um, and just you know people uh, you know get focused into specific um, ideas of what they need to be doing and where they need to be doing it and um, yeah don't think that the, the world is a big place and there's lots of lots of cool amazing jobs out there um, a couple of which you've mentioned already so I mean was there a was there a theme of the 25 or was it just 25 completely random placements um, or did they have it was there a central theme of travel or um, uh, behind them or um so I think there were quite a few of them that were based around writing, uh, which was a skill that I wanted to explore further. Um, and again, there was a few as well that were based abroad or that involved travel. Um, but generally, no, they were quite they were quite diverse. <laughs> I would say they were they were genuinely just things that I'd wondered about over the since you know you're asked as a small child what you want to be when you grow up. Um, since you answer that age six all the way up to age twenty four, um, and everything that I'd had kind of just lurking in the back of my head and some of them were serious ideas and some of them were less so um but it was a chance to really go and actually answer those questions for myself um 
Yeah, so I don't know, I'm trying to think. So it's literally as varied as property development um, to alpaca farming to uh, investigative journalism, so it's a telegraph for that one, to working at the British Council on crisis management, uh, to landscape gardening, interior design, uh, being an extra in a movie. So yeah, really, really varied. Um, and I ended up, after the first couple of placements, coming up with a set of uh criteria or careers attributes i guess because i realized that i needed a way to sort of objectively assess how much i liked a career because it, it sounds silly but i think it's very easy to be influenced by um the people that you're working with and if you get on really really well i think it it makes you like a job perhaps more than the work does or alternatively you can get the other way around where you hate the people that you're working with and it makes you think oh I don't like this career but actually it's just the people you're working with rather than the work and I think you, you need to find a way to kind of see through some of that particularly if you're only doing something for a couple of weeks you need to be quite uh not astute but I guess yeah try try and be as objective as you can during that time because you don't have long enough to make um a kind of a full judgment you're going off other people's views yeah and what criteria uh, did you use then to try and be a bit uh, subjective uh, so there's kind of three categories, I guess. So the first one is skills based, uh, so skills that both that I wanted to use and that I was also good at, and they're not always the same thing. Um, so for me, that was things like um, using writing. Um, it was things like um, thinking about things strategically. Um, so looking at the bigger picture, and I've, I've kind of learned that I'm not good at the, the small detail, but I am good at the big picture, and so kind of playing to that strength and that interest as well um things like problem solving um or but it could be anything it could be teamwork or leadership or analyzing data or whatever it is um so there was kind of that side and then next was what i wanted out of a career i think all too often we try and see how we fit into something else in, into a job description for example but we don't think about how well it suits us as the person that we are um and i realized that the jobs that i've been doing i was actually not very well suited to at all um, so for me, it was things like wanting to make a difference, uh, wanting to make kind of a positive impact on society. Uh, it was things like variety. I wanted to be doing something where it was a little bit unpredictable, a little bit, I might not know what I was going to be doing or where I was going to be working in a month or two months time. And obviously, you know, day in, day out, that's, there's only so much you can do. But on the whole, I wanted something that was, that was more varied um, than I've been doing before. Uh, and then I wanted to do something where um, I felt like I was making a, I was making an impact where me personally being in that specific job was was having some form of positive impact on the role rather than the sort of job where I kind of and I've been in before I felt like I could just be replaced by anybody it just I didn't matter um, basically I wanted to feel valued I think is what it kind of came down to um, and then the third category was working environment. And I think this is something that's very often overlooked, but is actually hugely important. And uh, that's, that's actually what, where you want to be and the sorts of people you want to be with. Um, so for young grads, they might want to be with other young grads, work with other young people, as an example. But it could be anything like, actually, do you want to be office based or do you want to be doing something practical with your hands or outdoors? Uh, and outdoors was a the theme of quite a few of the jobs that I did. Um, but it could be things like, do you want to work for an international company that will send you all over the world? Or do you want to work for a two-man startup from your garden shed? Um, and kind of really thinking about those things as well um, and trying to take those into account much more. Um, so for me, it was things like, again, working outdoors or some, some non-desk-based work, where I think how I phrased it, um, and travel as well was really important to me. Um, so yeah, so then I kind of literally cross-tick question mark for all of those uh, for each job to try and figure out a little bit more uh, about how each job fitted into who I was overall as a person and what I wanted from work. Oh, brilliant. And um, were there any placements that just you didn't enjoy or just really weren't for you at all? Uh, yeah, yeah, there was a couple. Um, I think uh, working in TV production uh, was not for me. Um, I think it was because the way that it was the way that it was when I was there was it was very um quite hierarchical you had to kind of be seen to do your time at each sort of level and work your way up and um something I've realized is that I enjoy working somewhere with a more of a flat structure um where kind of it doesn't matter where you are in the pecking order like if you've got a good idea you've got a good idea um and just a bit more um I guess yeah meritocracy and stuff like that so 
um yeah that that wasn't for me and that's the way the industry works and i i totally understand why because you know it's effectively project management on a massive scale um and it, that's how it needs to work but it just wasn't right for me and that's okay you know um yeah <laughs> uh, any any others apart from tv production uh there was a couple of others where i didn't get on with the people so much they weren't perhaps as welcoming and again that, that it was really difficult to try and not judge like, obviously an entire career based on an experience a negative experience with a few um temporary colleagues so that's kind of why i came up with the criteria was to try and say okay no i need to be really objective about this and not kind of judge this whole industry based off this two-week experience with some people that i didn't get on with because obviously that's not representative um so what i started to do was when i was in a placement um to interview uh, basically as many people as I could that were working there full time um, because again there's only so much you can learn in two weeks so I needed to go to the experts the people who are actually doing it and kind of ask their opinions and get a diverse range of views um, from them to try and uh, yeah understand that a bit better and recognize that obviously I cannot be an expert or fully understand a career in the space of two weeks and I'm very happy to acknowledge that yeah and which uh, which was your favorite place when which one blew your mind Mm. there's quite a few that did um there was quite a few that i guess challenged my expectations and my assumptions um so alpaca farming i think was one of those and it so they spent the whole mornings doing everything that i would have expected to so kind of animal husbandry and feeding animals and all that sort of stuff but then the afternoons were not what i'd expected at all and i was working with a farmer who was also an entrepreneur because to be a farmer and make a sustainable income in 2018, you can't just farm. You need to sell your products as well. And so with her alpacas, for example, for example, um, and I loved that it was a woman farmer, um, she got her alpacas, she sheared them, she sent the wool off to be spun into yarn. The yarn was then made into high-end luxury children's clothes um, and sold to uh, very expensive shops around the world. <laughs> And she managed every single step in that process, everything from literally helping an alpaca to give birth to negotiating with Selfridges or Harrods or whoever it was, um, to building websites and selling, trying to promote things on social media to finding a factory that will um, make the clothes to the high, a high enough standard and everything in that process um, she needed to be responsible for and run. And that was just one line of business that came out of that. And if you just think about the sheer number of skills that you need to do that, it's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. And I just, I guess I didn't realize how purely entrepreneurial that you have to be to be a farmer. And I found it really inspirational. And it was a really fantastic way of combining um, outdoor kind of practical work with really intellectually based entrepreneurship. Um, and again, it just broke down all the assumptions and stereotypes that I had. Um, and yeah, really blew my mind in that respect. Um, but then another one, and again, this was more circumstance than anything else, um, was travel writing. I um, wrote an article about a country that I'd been to with this travel company beforehand. Um, that I just kind of was playing around and seeing if I could write something. And I sent it to the company and said, by the way, I wrote this about you and I've named you. And they emailed me back and said, um, would you like to go to Venezuela for a month and write about that? Wow. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I was a little bit, a little bit taken aback, to be honest, um, and said yes, um, and figured out the details later. And a few months later, I got on a plane and went to Venezuela for a month. Um, and two days after I landed, um, it sort of broke out into semi-civil war, um, sort of, like not a full civil war, but kind of, I, yeah, I don't know how much you know about Venezuelan politics at the moment, but it's not, it's not great. Um, and everything escalated, I guess, while I was there. And um, so the travel writing experience got quite um, dramatic, got kind of uh, barricaded into the city for four days and firebombs going off and guns. And yeah, it was quite dramatic. We had to have a military escort out of the country and kind of generally being able to interview Venezuelans and kind of ask different perspectives about what was going on. It effectively turned into journalism as opposed to just travel writing for um, tourism. So it was, it was, yeah, a fascinating and unique experience um, that it wasn't quite what I bargained for, but um, obviously, yeah, was really, really interesting. Amazing. And uh, how did you, um, 
so 25 placements, two weeks of pop. How did you manage to um, survive? Because uh, I'm guessing <laughs> lots of them weren't uh, getting paid. Yeah, so um, I'd saved up quite a lot beforehand. Um, I not necessarily known what I was going to be doing, but I'd realised while I was working that, I don't know, I, I just had a sense that this might be quite a good idea. But generally, I'm a, I'm a saver anyway. I'm not a massive spender, so I've always saved um, and kind of always worked at university, had jobs since I was, you know, 14 and babysitting down the road. And so I did have like a little pot of savings to draw on um, that kind of waved goodbye to a potential house deposit. Um, and I um, worked throughout the year as well. I worked as a freelancer for quite a few of the companies that I did placements with. Uh, and that definitely made quite a difference um, financially. And then almost all the placements paid for my expenses and some just paid an actual salary. Um, so I kind of worked it out and I ended up being cost neutral. I didn't make anything, but I didn't lose anything. I just, I had enough to cover my expenses for the year and living kind of as a frugal student, the frugalist of students, um, but without obviously being an actual student. Um, so I kind of just took that approach. So I didn't buy any clothes for an entire year. I didn't, you know, go out and eat. I didn't go to a pub. I just kind of invited lots of people over to my house and or to my flat and then invited and then made sure that I was going over to friends' places rather than going out and just kind of really lived, yeah, yeah, a very, very student-friendly lifestyle for a year, despite the fact none of my friends were students anymore. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, just sort of taking that that sort of approach. Um, and I was lucky that I did have some savings that obviously did did help um, and was able to kind of earn little bits and pieces throughout the rest of the year as well. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And... So you've got all these brilliant work placements. What advice would you give to people who are applying for work placements? Because I know it's something that people uh, often uh, find a bit daunting. And also, mm -hmm. you know, it's difficult to, how do you, you've obviously got a great response rate from uh, from the ones you applied to. Uh, you know, how what advice would you give to people who are looking for work placements? So I think that I took kind of three different approaches um, and to mixed success rates but I got placements through all of these um so first one I used social media quite a lot um the alpaca farming for example I got through twitter I sent out a tweet I did some research on hashtags on the right hashtags to be using I sent out a tweet and within 10 minutes somebody offered me a placement oh, wow. um what was, literally the, what that was the hashtag for that I'd, I'd have to look it up to be honest I don't quite remember it's a couple of years ago now but um basically what I, I found was that most industries have really really specific hashtags for jobs yep. uh, within that industry and so if you kind of do a little bit of research send out a few tweets with the relevant hashtags um they tend to get picked up um and yes yeah, so that's one way that i did it um there's also the equivalent on facebook which there's quite a lot of professional networking uh, groups on and pages on facebook um in a different way to linkedin but um so i found again relevant ones for a couple of different industries and those are mostly media based um for jobs uh, for work experience placements in, in that and just put out requests on facebook groups and again had quite a quite a lucky pickup um to that um i did that for tv as well i think uh, tv production um but it worked better for that for facebook groups it worked better with um the sorts of jobs that tended to be um contract based or freelance anyway um, which is generally true um, for the media and tv production as well as kind of short-term jobs and you tend to hop around it's quite common um, within the industries not that i knew that at the time but um so I did that and then i did a lot of cold calling which is kind of the more usual approach so a lot of just emailing companies straight up with a cover letter and a cv uh, and seeing what happened um, i tended to find that i got a much much better response rate by targeting small companies yep. um, the smaller the better um, kind of under 10 people if possible because um, simply because they can make decisions so much faster uh, within 20 minutes your email can be sitting in front of a CEO because they're all sitting around the same table anyway um, and they can make a decision and then you can start on Monday it's just there's just less um, I guess bureaucracy or red tape that needs to get involved um, to compared to a, a larger organization where obviously there's lots of checks and balances that need to be gone through and HR departments and so it just it's just that bit harder I think um, with larger organizations uh, or smaller ones are just that bit more um, dynamic due to their size, I guess. Um, and I, find, I found it varied quite a lot by industry to how many um, requests I had to send out. So with property development, um, they said yes in the first hour of the first email I sent out. And wow. I was really lucky. 
which was great. Um, and then others, I'd send, you know, 40 different emails just to get one placement. Um, so it does it does vary by the competitiveness of the industry, um, even though I did find, I don't know, speaking, going to so many, every single one would kind of turn around and say, this is the most competitive industry you'll find. Um, but, I mean, nearly 25 of them all said that. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> therefore, I kind of assumed that, okay, you're all, you're all competitive, therefore, none of you are competitive, therefore, it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, Everyone always likes know. to think they're special. Yeah, yeah. And I think some probably were more competitive than others. But, you know, I think you're going for a job in a competitive world. You just <laughs> don't let that put you off when people say that, basically. And that's definitely something that did used to put me off as kind of a younger person. Um, yep. I said, oh, it's too competitive. And I freak out and think, oh, I can't do that. But that's not true. Um, what you, else? You've, uh, you've mentioned yeah. um, you mentioned look quite a few times uh throughout the interview and uh, you know that you were lucky to get placements but one of the things that strikes me is that the look hasn't played a part in it at all really it's you know you've you've gone out you've been bold you've obviously put a lot of time and thought into each of the applications you know you've tailored them you've um focused them on specific people and then you've put the work in and you've applied and sometimes it was the first people that got them that got back to you and other times it was a 41st person mm. you know that's not luck that's just hard work and you know putting the putting the effort in and and definitely listeners something that you should you know one of the key takeaways for me from this episode is you know if you do if you put the work in and you put the effort in then then you get the rewards um it's it's not down to luck Oh, I guess so. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, I, I don't know. I think some, I think, yeah, maybe or mostly, right. Um, I think some of them, like with archaeology, for example, having somebody turn around and say, oh, actually, yes, uh, we, we, could you come to Transylvania uh, immediately? But, but yeah, no, I, I take your point. I think there was a lot, of, there was a lot of hard work that definitely went into it um, without a doubt. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but those, those opportunities are there, you know, you just got to, you just got to reach out and ask for them. If you don't ask, then you never know. Um, well, exactly. I think thinking outside the box as much as possible is also um, a good way to do it. So um, the third way that I was going to kind of talk about was networking um, and trying to just find as many people as possible and shout about what you want to do to as many people as possible uh, to get the message out there, um, whether that's going to networking events, going to talks and lectures or literally just asking your hairdresser, um, <laughs> like anybody, because one thing I found is that you... You never know who knows someone yep. um, and that people like to talk about other people and use that to your advantage in, in the nicest way possible. Um, I think it's really important to talk to as many different people as you can, um, because, again, something I found is that you never know where you're going to end up when you start going down a path. You really don't. So that you might make that one connection with someone and you might not think anything of it. But that grows and that, that develops over a year or two. And then you end up, I don't know, starting a business with them or whatever it is. But you really don't know where that's going to end up when you start. And so it's really worth investing in other people and investing your time in other relationships. Mm, completely agree. Um, so you've done 25 work placements. What advice would you give people to um, who are going to undertake work placements just so that they can make the most of them? How can they really hit the ground running and make an impact? So I think um, it depends whether you're talking about work experience or internships, but um, I'll touch on internships mostly first. Um, I think, sorry, on work experience mostly first. Um, I think work experience placements tend to be quite short, so a week or two. Um, I think ultimately to make the best use of it, it's almost not so much about the work. It's about the rest of the people that you're working with and going for a coffee one on one with as many different people as you can in that team over the space of your placement and asking them about their views, because you've got to realize that you're going in for a really short period of time. You're not going to get an objective view of an entire career if you sit at your desk and just do the few tasks that you're set for two weeks. But you are in a room full of 10, 20, however many uh, experts in that career industry because that, that's what they do all day every day and you've got a unique opportunity to ask the experts effectively um, about what they think and I think it's really important to ask about the best days and all the good things but also ask about the bad stuff you want to know what a bad day looks like uh, and what that's like because you don't want to realize after you've consumed that 
that actually you're expected to work weekends and evenings and that's not something you're prepared to do, for example. Um, or maybe it is, but I think it's something that you need to know up front. You need to know the good and the bad at the same time. Um, and that's that's really, really important. No, that's, uh, that's great advice. And put the effort in, get the placement and then just uh, make sure you, you don't slack off then, but you then you, you know, yeah. carry on, you work hard. And um, Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, I don't think really... To yeah, I think it'd be really proactive with work. And sorry, not to say that the work's not important that you do. Obviously it is. Um, but don't kind of, I, I don't know, I've also been in the workplace and had people come in for work experience and work for me. And all too often you kind of see people sit there and not speak to anybody else for yeah. two weeks and kind of, and they, they do the job, and they do the job well, and that's great. Um, but I think it's it's about communicating with others and about really trying to understand it so that you get something out of it much more so. Um but yeah, obviously do the work that you're given to the best of your ability and to kind of really be really proactive in terms of getting work as well. Like not kind of thinking, OK, I've, I've done everything I've been set. Uh, what else? Like kind of really going out and speaking to others and saying, well, how can I help you? How can I do more of what you do? What, what can I do? Um, and speaking up, basically. So time, Emma, unfortunately, is running away with us. So maybe oh. one final question before we move on to the, the quick fire questions this week. Um, You've been on the fast stream. You've had these 25 careers. Uh, what does the future hold for you now with your book coming out? Um, so as I said, the book is coming out on, it's coming out on the 3rd of January. Um, so I guess it kind of depends um, what how well the book does. Um, if it does well, um, I very much hope there'll be a book too. And I'm kind of in, in discussion at the moment with publishers about a second book. Um, and if not, then uh, I'm looking to start um, it up as a business um, and have kind of a business plan and a potential partner um, to help other young people when kind of they're in a bit of a career crisis about what do you do about it and to kind of set up a series of placements for other young people, work experience placements to go away and try them for themselves. Um, so basically, yeah, turning the 25 Before 25 project into into a startup. Ah, excellent. And listeners, you'll be able to find links to everything that we've discussed today, including a full transcript over at the website at graduatejobpodcast.com slash 25. So Emma, time to uh, for the final few quickfire questions now. So be interested uh, in your responses here. So you mentioned about your book coming out, but uh, yes. what one book would you recommend listeners that they should read to help them on their job search? Oh, um, I thought, um, oh, what color is your pal parachute is uh, a really good practical way um, to guide you through uh, career decisions. So it's, uh, I think they republish a new edition every year and it's very up to date in terms of, you know, social media and tech and stuff like that. Um, and it's also a really, really good um, practical book kind of guiding you through how to make career decisions and thinking about who you are as a person. Um, so I definitely point readers in that direction. Ah, excellent. And um, were you devouring lots of career related books when you were having your existential crisis during the fast room? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And I was one in particular uh, was how to find fulfilling work um, by as an author working for the School of Life. Um, and that was really, really impactful for me because obviously one of the main things that I wanted to do in my career was to find um, work that felt like I was making a difference. Um, so that that was a great book for kind of figuring out what it is that how how yeah effectively what it says in the title how to find fulfilling work. Uh, it really did answer that question very well. Oh, brilliant! And uh, links to both of those books will be over in the show notes, as I mentioned, graduatejobpodcast.com dot slash twenty five. And Emma, what one internet resource would you point people towards? Oh, there's loads. Um, I think I've used um, Grad Touch quite a lot, uh, which is a graduate jobs um, website, but their career advice stuff um, and articles are really, really, really good and really useful. Um, I really enjoyed that. Ah, excellent. That's not one uh, I've come across, so I will, uh, yeah. I will check them out myself. And finally, Emma, what one job search tip can people implement today to help them find a job? Um, I would say um, I use LinkedIn a huge amount more than I think quite a lot of people do. Um, so I think it's job search is obviously 
in many cases you want a job as quickly as possible but I think there's a lot to be said for investing in relationships and going back to that point I've made about networking so what I did was upgraded my LinkedIn to a premium account which you can do for free for a month um, and I then kind of stopped it after a month before I started charging me and that means that you can contact um, anybody directly on LinkedIn so I had a, literally a list of people's names that I wanted to contact. I'd kind of done some research and looked through their LinkedIn profiles and kind of thought, I really like your career. I really like where, what you're doing, where you are. And I sent them all, like, honestly, 100 people messages to say, can I take you out for coffee and learn more about what you do? Oh, well. Wow. And I got uh, X number of people came back and said yes, and X number of people completely ignore me. Um, but, you know, that's normal. Um, and the ones that said yes, we then went out for coffee and learned about what they did um for a career and that's when you then start to say oh maybe i could come along for a bit of work experience for a couple of weeks um after you, as you start to build up a relationship with people you start to get to know them a little bit better yeah. and then you can start to ask those questions um and i found that to be a really really successful uh, method that nobody had really told told me i not heard from, like about before uh, in terms of searching for a job and it can take a little bit longer but i think it's much better in terms of targeting um targeting careers or jobs that you wouldn't have otherwise come across or been exposed to these aren't jobs that are advertised necessarily on companies websites this is part of the hidden jobs market which ends up being i think it's between 60 to 80 percent of jobs aren't yeah. advertised yeah. um and it's kind of that backdoor um approach that's a brilliant tip and listeners one you should definitely definitely put to practice that's uh, that's great advice emma Thank you so much for appearing on the Graduate Job Podcast. What's the best way that people can uh, keep in touch with you and the work that you do? Um, so you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram, which is at 25 before 25, or subscribe to my website, which is www.25before25.co.uk. Emma, thank you so much for appearing on the Graduate Job Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Boom. Listeners, there you go. The brilliant Emma Rosen. And what an impressive story, eh? Much that I admire in it. Firstly, having the persistence to get the graduate job of her dreams with the civil service, despite being turned down several times. To then have the guts to realise that actually it wasn't what she really wanted to do and it was making her unhappy and to walk away from it all. Now that must have been a really difficult decision to make and I know personally how I have hung around in jobs much longer than I should have done. So to then back herself with going for 25 careers before the age of 25, and having the determination to make it happen. Absolutely brilliant. Now if she can do it, why can't you? If you can put the effort and dedication in, then you can make it happen too. Now these placements didn't fall into her lap. As she said, some of them took 49 rejections before the 50th one said yes. Now that is dedication for you. So my respect goes out to Emma. So that brings us to the end of episode 79 and the final episode for 2018. Now I only managed to get out 11 episodes in 2018 so I really must do better in 2019 and I will, I promise you that. Now if you've been enjoying and getting value from the show you can thank me by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to the show. It will be massively appreciated and will be a little Christmas present to me. One which was left recently is from Ashok over in the US who said, I love the show. Thanks for helping me to get ready for the graduate job interviews I have coming up. Thanks Ashok. Thanks for taking the time out and to leave me a five star review. So if you do the same, I will read it out next time. So that is everything for 2018. Have a lovely Christmas and a very happy new year. And I will be back on the 2nd of January with an episode about the brilliant Change 100 internship from the Leonard Cheshire Trust. It will be a lovely one to start the new year off with. I hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, hope you use it and apply it. Speak to you next year.